Giant Fighting Robots. No matter how old you are, watching giant mech-like machines battling it out in movies, in comics, anime, games and TV shows has never not looked awesome. Well, for the most part. Metal on metal action has been tried again and again in these mediums, but when it comes to the real world, the closest thing we have is Robot Wars or BattleBots. Of course, plenty of other miniature remote-controlled fighting tournaments have come and gone throughout the years too, but as great as these were, let's face it, they're not giant fighting robots, are they? Nope. But thankfully, back in 2018, three ingenious engineers took to Kickstarter to create that very thing, and what's better is they already had a giant fighting robot in hand. And I don't want to spoil the ending, guys, but yes, a giant fighting robot tournament did take place. The problem was, it wasn't exactly what the vast majority of backers or fans expected. In fact, it's a story that will no doubt split my audience right down the middle, and one that I'm sure that the majority of you guys watching will be arguing amongst yourselves. Which, of course, I encourage because, well, you know, it helps the algorithm, doesn't it? Also, you know, whilst you're down there, make sure you hit the subscribe and like button too, whilst I, DJ Slope, tell you all the story of Kickstarter's giant fighting robots. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. But first, have you ever Googled yourself and been shocked to see your personal information on public listing sites? It's crazy. I personally looked up an older distant family member who hasn't got any kind of social media presence and I found their name, I found their age, uh, their kids' names, and I can also find him via searching for those people too. Data brokers are making a fortune selling your information to robocallers, spammers, and others who want to learn more about you, which is why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, Aura. Aura can identify data brokers exposing your info and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. Brokers are legally required to move your info if you ask them to, but they make it super hard to do. Thankfully, Aura can handle that for you. And best of all, you can try Aura out for free for two weeks by using the link below. On top of this, Aura does loads more to protect you and your family from online threats you can't see, and it's really easy to set up. No longer will you need to download several apps to get antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and most important for me, parental controls, now you get everything at one affordable price. As a parent with a couple of kids that constantly want to sign up to new games and services, a service like Aura is an absolute must. Let Aura do the hard work of keeping you and your family safe online so you can focus on other things with peace of mind. You can either let people continue to exploit and profit off your private information, or you can go to aura.com forward slash slopes to start your two-week free trial. Links, again, are down below. Thanks for the sponsor, but let's continue on with the video. Our story starts with a couple of engineering students from college Guy Cavalcanti and Andrew Stroop, who after graduating continued to work together on plenty of projects involving robotics. In fact, Guy even went as far as briefly working at Boston Dynamics. You know, the abuse them till they dance robotic company. However, he eventually left the Cybertron beta testing group and opened up his own makerspace location called Artisan's Asylum, where he and like-minded individuals could continue to build some truly exceptional robotic things, like an off-road wheelchair for his injured girlfriend. But on top of this, the duo were even part of the Big Brain Theory TV show that aired on Discovery. I get excited about building giant robots. A sort of reality-based competition show where engineers would battle it out and make crazy contraptions based on whatever was required that week. But again, as cool as this all was, it's got nothing to do with giant fighting robots, does it? Which brings us to our first of four Kickstarters we're going to be looking at today. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Stompy. A giant 
walking robot that kind of looks like a mechanical spider. The Kickstarter needed $65,000 and it got $97,817 from 1,571 backers. And you may be thinking to yourself, because I know I was, what the hell are the backers getting out of this? Well, practically nothing. It had a delivery date of October 2012 and it's still not finished. Backers pledged from $5 for a shout out, several higher tiers for bumper stickers, wristbands and t-shirts were included too, and at the very top end you got the opportunity to actually ride on Stompy yourself. But best of all, for $5,000 you can not only have your company logo on one of the legs, but you can also design a shape like, for instance, your company logo that will then get pressed into the ground every single time Stompy stomped around. Now, even though from what I can tell, the lower end tiers, like your bumper stickers, your t-shirts, all that sort of stuff, they did get sent out. But those higher end tiers, well, they've not been fulfilled because Stompy is still not finished. Unfortunately, trying to find updates on this is incredibly hard these days, as the campaign owners have completely given up updating their loyal backers as of November 3rd, 2005. 14. Heck, even their own blog hasn't seen an update since July of 2019, leaving only a small YouTube channel that isn't branded in any way to this campaign, which every so often gets an uploaded 5 second video of Stompy doing practically nothing. And as always is the way when a campaign ends like this, you end up getting the backers themselves going to investigate to try and find updates themselves. Sadly for them, what they found wasn't good, because Guy, one of the key players here, had started yet another Kickstarter campaign. Now, to be fair, Stompy wasn't Guy's project. He did help out with this, but the important thing to take away is that several members had moved on to other things. Guy being one of them, and Andrew Stoop, well, the two of them, they still wanted to create giant fighting robots. As according to an interview with Popular Science back in 2015, Andrew said to Guy during this time that if you find some investor crazy enough to give us money, I promise you that wherever I am, I'll come help you build giant robots. And that's exactly what he did with newcomer to the team, Matt Orline. Now, Matt had been on the scene for a short while already, after Guy had set up meetings with several other Makerspace owners, which is something that Matt also ran in Detroit. The friendship blossomed between the two after said meetings as Matt tried to get a job at Boston Dynamics and asked Guy for tips. Sadly for the time, Matt was unsuccessful in getting that job. However, in hindsight, that is a good thing as Matt and Guy could then go off and make these giant fighting robots thanks to their new investor, Josh Adler. Now, Josh was no stranger to Guy and his team. He was an investor looking for inventions to invest in, to pitch to bigger companies, and then ultimately sell off for a profit. And apparently, it was over a few beers where the trio were coming up with new ideas and new inventions for Josh to invest into, where Guy took a chance. He brought up, say it with me, giant fighting robots, and to his surprise, Josh liked the idea. From Josh's point of view, this investment just changed from being a technological investment that he could turn around quickly and sell into an entertainment investment that's worth sticking around for. This new vision was something that he could turn into a massive multimedia sporting league if they could pull it off, that is. So, with that first investment in hand, Andrew became the builder for a short while, Guy became the designer, and Matt became the electrical engineer. Megabots was born. This was where the team's sponsor, Autodesk, also got involved. The company even to this day likes to do rather wacky marketing, the sort of stuff that tends to go viral, but doesn't always achieve that goal. But with something as back crazy as Megabots, it was a win-win for the company. As the giant fighting robots showed off what their computer-aided design software packages could help make, as it toured different technology spaces up and down the country, as well as Megabot's own growing YouTube channel, it gave Autodesk plenty of exposure. To design this bad boy, in short, the Megabots team paid an artist to come up with the design. They would then go back and forth with the artist, making sure it could actually be done. And then, of course, they went ahead and designed it using Autodesk. The first robot cost them roughly $200,000 and a year and a half to make. 
and even before it was finalized, the torso and moving cannon, which was going to be attached to one of its arms, was shown off separately at events like New York Comic Con 2014. And even though it was essentially in pieces, the crowd went wild for this thing. Would you believe it? A convention full of nerds just so happened to be the perfect setting to promote the dream of a giant fighting robot, which is exactly what they did by handing out leaflets that promoted the upcoming Kickstarter campaign, which went live on October 29th, 2014. However, the goal wasn't just to finish off this giant fighting robot, but instead to create a giant fighting robot tournament. A sports league, if you will, the start of a continuous fighting event where fans could get behind and support their favorite machine or crew similar to football, wrestling, and pretty much any other type of sport. But in order to do this, just like all good successful campaigns, they needed a kick-ass video. Thankfully for them, they were still in contact with the production team at Discovery and therefore decided to fly them all over and create a stunning Discovery Channel level video that cost them no less than $50,000. But none of that mattered as this project we love real world Titanfall remake was not a success. It needed 1.8 million and gained slightly more than $65,000, meaning that almost half of it came from just three people. Ouch. The team were completely defeated. They felt like they had failed miserably. Do people really want a giant fighting robot tournament? Well, to put it simply, the answer was yes. Because Autodesk wanted a giant fighting robot tournament, and even though the Kickstarter was a massive failure, the company still saw potential and offered to continue paying for the completion of the robot. Just as long as Megabots relocated to their personal makerspace, and of course, Autodesk can continue to use it as promotion at their own events, starting with Maker Faire. Meaning, they only had three months to finish this robot in fall and show it off to the public. The next part of our story is going to be a little bit strange, as Matt and Guy actually hired somebody to turn this whole story into a comic, and by all accounts, it's quite an accurate retelling. Sure, it's a little bit overdramatic compared to the real events, and a few of the names have been changed too for privacy and or legal reasons, but all in all, according to Matt himself, it is a fairly accurate retelling of the move to Autodesk, sorry, Manual Desk's personal makerspace and the challenges that the duo faced along the way. Links to everything can be found down in the description for you guys to go peruse yourself once the video is finished, but in short, they say yes to Manual Desk's offer. They buy a beat up old truck from a mob boss to transport it in. They fight tooth and nail through snowstorms trying to get this thing onto the truck. They pay off a copper who pulls them over for hauling a load too heavy for the vehicle they are using. Due to time constraints, they are forced to completely rebuild the mech's design and as a result, change the legs for tank-like wheels pulled from a burnt out old JCB. And yes, they did all of this within only three months, resulting in not only a pretty damn impressive achievement, but unfortunately, Unfortunately, one that was held back from their true aspirations due to money and time. The end result was a success for Autodesk as it was shown on time at the Makers Fair with plenty of promotion to go along with it. The problem for Megabots, however, was… well, what now? The duo had finished the job, but they had run out of things to do with their one-of-a-kind giant fighting robot. And what's worse is that Megabots had run out of money again. In fact, the company was on the verge of bankruptcy. Thankfully, they soon realized that they didn't just have a giant fighting robot, they had something far more special. They had a story. A story that was quite fantastic, and a story that surely someone's going to want to turn into a reality TV show? Meetings were set up with companies such as Disney, WWE, and even the Justin Bieber agency, apparently. And yes, they did sign a couple of rubbish deals, but the long and short of it was that nobody was fully invested into turning this into a show. Or at least, they didn't have the money to back up their promises. You see, in order to show off giant fighting robots, well, you kind of need two giant fighting robots, and Megabots only had the one. 
Thankfully for them, the Mark II, eventually renamed to Iron Glory, wasn't the first of its kind. The duo remembered seeing a news article back in 2015 where some crazed Japanese inventor had also built a mech-like robot and was selling it on Amazon for anyone that fancied dropping the equivalent of $1.35 million. The 30 hydraulic jointed Caradas could fire 6,000 BBs per minute and seemed like the perfect way to build up hype for Megabots and hopefully finally give us that giant fighting robot tournament that we always wanted to see. Guy ran to Facebook looking for friends that could translate Japanese and when he found one, he sent a message to the Japanese company asking them that if they released a video challenging them to a duel, would they accept? And they responded, yes, yes they will. Just as long as that original video gets a set amount of views and they bring a robot to the table that's a bit more melee fist fighting combat styly. Welcome to Megabot's World Headquarters, the densest concentration of cutting-edge robotics research this side of the Mississippi. This is where the Megabot Mark II was born, born with the fires of American innovation and determination. We just finished tightening the last bolts on the Mark II, America's first fully functional, giant piloted robot. And because we're American, we've added really big The 4th of July was right around the corner at this point. The Megabots team made a stupidly patriotic and super cringy It's Brilliant Pitch video, which definitely hit Japan's required target and then some. And in turn, the Japanese team held up their end of the bargain by responding with their video and the whole thing blew up. I mean, the thing went like so crazy viral. I remember just like waking up and like the phone was just like buzzing. Like I thought my alarm was going off. You know, like my phone was just like bzz, 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 on my nightstand. And it wasn't the alarm, it was just like the emails coming in, and it was all like TNN, NBC, like ABC, like it would like NPR, CNN, you know, it's like all these like people requesting interviews from like every possible, you know, place you could imagine. And mm. so, yeah, it was just, it was, it was just like weird. I will probably never experience something like that ever again in my life. Sweet Obashi. We have a giant robot, you have a giant robot. You know it needs to happen. We challenge you to a duel. Both of our robots will need modifications to become combat ready. Prepare yourselves and name the battlefield. In one year, we fight. Those videos had gone so viral that he was getting constant news stations trying to get a hold of them to tell their story. Heck, they even had an offer from the state senator of Hawaii that liked the idea so much, he invited them over to have the fight at Pearl Harbor. Yeah, we got a email from like a senator in Hawaii or something like that, or a congressperson. I can't remember if it was a senator or a congressperson, but it was basically like, we will host the fight in like Pearl Harbor. <laughs> Which, uh, uh, I'm not sure if that's like offensive to anybody or not, but like whatever. Um, yeah, we got a we got a whole bunch of people who were like wanted to host the fight and uh, just crazy emails from everyone. I mean, the thing went like so crazy viral. Surely now with everyone in the world talking about Megabots and this Japanese versus American fight, all of those execs out there that didn't think enough people would be interested are going to finally give these guys the contracts that they deserve to make a proper reality TV show. Nope. We were totally wrong. They did not cave on anything. They were just like, no, here's the agreement. Like, you can sign it or not. So we were like, Shit. like, we did not get the negotiating leverage that we thought we would get. So, like, what are we going to do? We're still broke. All right, let's, it's time to just like hit Kickstarter again. I want to take a ride. Team Megabots went to Kickstarter for a second time in order to raise funds and make the Mark II combat ready to take on Japan. They asked for $500,000 and this time they were successful pulling in $554,592 from 7,857 backers. Again, you had all of the usual rewards like before such as t-shirts on the lower end, unlockable Megabox characters in a Steam game called Robocraft, they teased that a documentary was in the works and 
backers of any tier above $10 could get information regarding that. And of course, you got the higher end stuff like ride alongs and pit crew experiences too, which by the way, they did fulfill. Was yeah, that the $10,000 join yeah. the pit? Oh, yeah, that's actually round yeah. two. Join the pit crew round two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we were like, oh, shit. like that's really bringing in money super fast. Like, yeah, okay, let's just like open up another round of that. So we like open up another round of that, and, like those sell out like the next day, and we're like, God. and they like, so the money was just like coming in super fast, and you're like, um, you know, but but there was always the question of like what. Like, we don't really know what the fight's going to be like, so we kind of felt bad about opening it up further, but anyways. But of course, the real draw from the majority of people out there was to see this fight actually happen. The world's first giant fighting robot tournament. The team had expanded quite a bit by this point too, thanks to all of the media bars. You got Grant Imahara of Mythbusters fame, Peter Diamonds from XPRIZE, you had the founders of BattleBots involved, and Autodesk were once again sponsoring the event too, along with several other companies such as AME Cloud Ventures, Azure Capital, V1VC, and a whole heap of unnamed angel investors, a lot of which came in after the Kickstarter was successful. And as great as all of this was, the team had no choice but to hype it up more and more and more to get more investors in to fund operations. The thing that just kept bringing in money was just hype, just hyping the fight. It's like a boxing match, you know? Like you make all the money with the hype. This was the main focus for the team. They simply just couldn't stop. They wouldn't stop and they needed to continuously hype up how crazy this giant fighting robot tournament will be. When in reality, nobody knew how it would turn out as this was something that had never been done before. So the money was just like coming in super fast and you're like, um, you know, but, but there was always the question of like, what? Like, we don't really know what the fight's going to be like. We didn't really know, like, how big is this going to end up being? Like, are we going to have, like, a stadium? Like, what is, what is it going to be? We really kept kicking the can down the road on, like, what is the fight actually going to be? Like, real, I mean, really. Like, you have two robots, and, like, like what's going on? Are they... Are they actually like trying to destroy each other? Like there's people inside, you know, like are, are the people going to die? Like, are they like, what is like, what is really going to happen? All they knew was that they needed to turn Iron Glory into some kind of melee fighting machine, which they didn't do. Yeah, the plan going into the Kickstarter was we were going to give this one a paint job and give it like some weapons or whatever. Sure. Some hand to hand weapons. I do kind of wonder if, like, we should have just done that. <laughs> like, if we would have just, like, saved a bunch of money and made, like, a... Just stayed with a much more underpowered but cheaper robot. I don't know. I think maybe that could have worked better. I don't really know. But anyways, we had millions of dollars and we were like, let's just build a whole new robot. Like, just build the coolest shit we can think of. Thankfully, the backers didn't seem to mind too much that a brand new robot was being built. Sure, the updates were a little bit too spaced out, but when they did come in, they were great. The initial delay wasn't all that bad. However, as time went on, those backers got more and more wound up that the campaign had changed to updates on the new robot and very little was being shared about the giant robot fight. The time to fly to Japan and finally sort out this fight was now. I know we took a trip over to Japan and I and I just remember like they had a 3D printed model of Karatas, their, you know, their robot. Mm -hmm. And then they had like a 3D printed model of one of our robots. I can't remember. I think it was I think it was maybe Iron Glory. I can't remember. They like plop these two things down and they're like, OK. What do you guys like think this fight is actually <laughs> like what it like and you and we're like taking the robots and we're like kind of like trying to put, like push them together and they're just kind of like you know the arms aren't really like that long they're kind of like stumpy like robots t-rex things going on yeah yeah and i just remember it like kind of becoming like real for me at that point where i was like oh shit like yeah how is this actually gonna happen 
on October 12, 2017, slightly over a year later than originally intended, the battle between America's MK3, now known as Eagle Prime, and Japan's beefed-up Karatis robot would take place live, according to the Kickstarter update, only five days later. But... It wasn't live. The update showed that this was a pre-recorded thing. Look, whatever. It doesn't matter. Everyone just wanted to see this giant fighting robot tournament already. America versus Japan. All of that hype was built up to this. And uh, yeah, it wasn't what people expected. Robot Duel. Welcome to the Steel Mill. So we are inside this venue in Japan, originally designed to pour steel, and now we are here to break it. Hi again, everybody. I'm Mike Goldberg. Expect the unexpected. What you will see today is the first of its kind. All right, here's how you win. Knock down your opponent, disable their robot, and if for any reason their pilot taps out, you take the match. Let's check back in with Mari, who's with Team Megabot. Taking on a very typical shouty, loud, and aggressive sporting style similar to wrestling, I suppose. The fight was less this, and more this. Karate is moving in, taking cover behind that wall of barrels. This is the best it's ever felt. Eagle Prime gets off the first shot, but it looks like it breaks up inside the barrel. The second shot is effective. Exposing Karatis to another attack. Keep going, keep going. I want to close in on him. Eagle Prime crashes through the barrels. I bet you they can't even feel that. That robot is 12 tons. And there's a third shot. Okay, I hit him. I don't know if it's doing anything, but I hit him. It was painfully obvious from the get-go that the fight was staged. It was filmed over several days, a scene with the sunlight beaming in at certain points and being pitch black in others. It included camera trickery, like when Iron Glory got pushed over, it had tinted windows to hide the fact that nobody was actually inside. Reshooting that scene again with a crane lifting it slightly back up off the ground, putting Matt and Guy into the mech and then dropping it again and then slightly stitching the clips together. You had plenty of rejigging of both robots throughout the fight. In fact, Karatis couldn't turn at all, meaning that the Japanese team had to stop the cameras, reposition their robot to face another direction, dust away the footprints, and then start filming again. In other words, it could only go forwards and backwards. In fact, Japan supposedly brought along their own second robot too. It's in this warehouse somewhere, but they decided not to use it as it was just simply too small compared to the much bigger American behemoths, and they didn't want to get it damaged. At one point in the fight, Japan is shooting America with paintballs, and America responds by smashing up a lighting rig and spinning it around to block the fire. Kind of like a lightsaber in Star Wars, I think, but about 50% more lame. Of course, the slow spinning of the metal beam did nothing to protect the mech from the paintballs being fired at it, and obviously the commenters didn't need to jump out of the way because the slow-moving robots were <coughs> out of control. At one point, Sudaboshi sends in a drone to, I mean, I don't know, spy on the other robot? Who knows? The plan was to make it look like Eagle Prime was trying to swat it away, but what ended up happening was that Eagle Prime accidentally instantly knocked it and it went down. <laughs> In fact, one of the only unscripted real pieces of damage to come from this whole thing was when the chainsaw was ripping up the paintball arm of Karatis. Apparently Matt was looking at the other arm was doing, not realizing that the chainsaw arm was causing genuine damage to the Japanese robot arm, something that Sudabashi's team were really not happy about. However, it ended up being one of the only real highlights of this competition. They really wanted us to like limit the amount of damage we were doing to their robot um, because they like they weren't as well funded as us and like that that was a mistake on my part. <sighs> Honestly looking back I was like I don't know it's like kind of good that like we got a little more damage but yeah they were not happy about that um, and it was a mistake on my part. I guess in retrospect, I was kind of glad it happened because it looked kind of cool. But um, yeah, that is an example of like part of the fight 
that was that was not scripted. The end result was that America won and Japan was pissed off. Yeah, I think they I think they were a little <laughs> I think they were a little out of their comfort zone um, right, through right. the fight. Um, and and really through the whole like you know whatever it was two year two three I don't even remember how many many years leading up to the fight when they accepted our challenge they thought it was going to be kind of this like underground art project where we just kind of like oh yeah we like bring the robots and we kind of like film this thing with our iPhones and like we kind of release it to the world we don't really say much and we just kind of like see how people react to it or whatever and just like kind of let it be its own little like whatever kind of like cult classic kind of like little thing that robot nerds love and it happened once and then maybe it never happens again but we raised you know megabots we just kept taking on all this investment and when you take on all the investment you have to keep selling a bigger and bigger dream because you got to pay the investors back so you know every time you take on another million you got to kind of grow your vision a little bit more to be like okay it's not a fun you know it's not just like us versus them fight it's like a sports league now it's like it's going to be this big arena tournament eventually we're going to have you know video games and toys and blah 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 and you know halloween costumes and this and special megabots branded aviators and you know the megabots breakfast cereal and like the video game and like blah 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 blah, blah all this stuff and the japanese guys really did like they're they're more conservative and they're like whoa 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 we did not sign up to be part of like we are not part of your sports league we are not part of this whole like entertainment sports league thing whatever like we're just doing a cool little underground robot fight video on youtube we're just we just want to make a youtube video that's all in fact japan tried to stop them uploading the video which the megabots team couldn't do because they had investors screaming down their throats we had like some arguments about the final draft of the duel and they basically didn't give us approval to post it and we just posted it anyways um and so they were pretty they were pretty pissed off i think it had i know there was one really weird thing that they basically said like you can't have us like lose the final round because a japanese person would never give up so it's not accurate to show like a japanese person saying like oh i i you know resign or whatever you know like i um I forfeit the match or whatever. It's getting too dangerous. Like they're like a Japanese person would never do that. So you can't show that you, you can. If you watch it again, you'll notice that like the fight's just sort of like happening. And then the and then the announcer just kind of goes like, well, and that's it. The fight, you know, uh, Sudabashi like loses and Megabots wins or something. But like the Japanese pilot doesn't like he doesn't really go like, oh, okay, I like tapping out or whatever, or the you win. I don't know. It, like, it's, there was something a little weird with like how it ended. And outside of the contenders themselves, the fight was met with a mostly negative response. The more and more they hyped this fight, the more and more people believed we were going to get real fighting robots, which just wasn't the case. In a very open live stream that Matt himself created going through all of the details of the stage segments of this fight, he explains that even within Megabots, it was never truly agreed upon as to what it should be. Some people at the company saw it as a real giant fighting robot tournament, whilst others saw it as a more of a robotic version of wrestling. <laughs> I've got to be careful here because I know I've got a hell of a lot of wrestling fans that watch this channel. As impressive as wrestling is, as impressive as the athletes are and the show is of WWE and other wrestling events, let's get real here for a second, guys. They're not legitimate fights. That's not taking anything away from the incredible physicality of these, in some cases, absolutely insane stunt performers that do incredible work, but the end result is predetermined, just like this robot duel. And depending on how you feel about that statement is probably going to be a good indicator as to how you feel about the first ever giant fighting robot tournament. It was a predetermined battle, created by some rather ingenious individuals and, without a doubt, most definitely overhyped. Backers and viewers of this event were split. We've had decades of games, comics, TV shows and movies teasing us as to what this overdue Kickstarter was going to offer. But surprise, surprise, not only would that be truly stupid thing for any athlete to ever be a part of, 
but more importantly, the technology is just simply not there. Regardless, just like the crazy amount of Kickstarters that I've backed and was eventually disappointed with the final release, at least they were released. And well, with that in mind, Megabots was a success. They created a giant fighting robot, they sent out all of the rewards, they updated the backers throughout the life of the campaign, and they provided their own end goal of a giant fighting robot tournament that some people were happy with, but the majority were not. This whole ordeal left the Megabots company in the same position that they were in before. The company had run out of money for a third time. The company had performed their giant fighting robot duties, but this time they were left with two machines that they didn't know what to do with, and worse still, were bleeding the company money. Which finally brings us to our third and final Kickstarter that was created to help start the first true live unscripted and live streamed giant fighting robot tournament, but it only reached 54000 of a $950,000 goal and was eventually cancelled when the team realised that they were not going to be hitting target. What followed was the sale of Iron Glory to some company in Japan. A cancelled video game, a not so popular mobile game that they plan to use the money from to continue the tournaments, NFTs that virtually nobody purchased, several videos as part of Megabot Season 2 on YouTube that just simply didn't pull in the views that they did before the first major fight, a ticketed event held at the warehouse where Eagle Prime was stored, where he smashed up old cars and washing machines for guests to enjoy. This event barely broke even money-wise, and finally got a proper request to fight against the already existing Canadian Robo Dragon machine in front of a live audience that again didn't pull in the required views needed for it to be a success and therefore didn't go ahead. No matter what they did, nothing worked, resulting in the eventual bankruptcy of Megabots. And Eagle Prime getting put up on eBay with a $1 starting bid and no reserve. Eagle Prime, the current world champion battle mech, is on eBay right now. Bidding starts at $1 and there's no reserve. I've got a link to the auction in the description and if it's already sold, I'll be making another video about that shortly. So if you want to get notified when that happens, be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Now, this was a video that did quite well. To Matt's credit, he goes into extreme lengths talking about what you will be getting, how much it costs to maintain, what issues arise when using it, and what extras will be included. Sadly for him, the bid was won at around about the $150,000 mark by several time wasters who were apparently just helping get the bids up which resulted in getting it put up on eBay again, and this time without the marketing of Matt's viral video, and then obviously this time going through an approved bidding system, meaning that they were only able to raise a little bit less than $30,000. Do you know how much it went for roughly, or do you know? Yeah, it was like it was like 30, it was like just under 30,000. I think it was like 29.99 or something like that, or eh, around 30, around 30,000. So that's like significantly less than it costs to make. Way less. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was funny because all these, you know, all my friends and stuff, I would tell them, yeah, I sold the robot on eBay. They're like, oh, what, what did you sell for? And I was like, $30,000 or whatever. <laughs> and they're like, what did it cost to build? And I was like, I don't know, probably like 2.5 million. And they're like, oh my God, like what a huge <laughs> loss. And like, yeah, you can look at it that way. However, the flip side of that is, I wouldn't have bought the thing for a dollar. <laughs> I wouldn't have even taken yeah, yeah, it for free. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's different. When yeah, you yeah. have that thing in your possession, <laughs> it's constantly sucking money out of you. So, like, it's not even an asset because you can't really make money with it. The winner of the mech owned a destruction derby slash monster truck show. And even though footage does exist of the mech arriving at its new home, it's only ever been seen a few times due to the overly complex nature of actually running the machine in the first place. Meaning that it spends its days now sitting inside a dusty warehouse, only ever getting the odd picture uploaded to social media by someone who no doubt has no idea what to do with this useless but also magnificent machine. And that's it. 
the story of Megabots is the sort of thing that Kickstarter is designed for. An overly ambitious project that is being looked after by people that can actually perform the job at hand. Sadly, the outcome may not have been to everyone's liking. And in short, that battle most definitely harmed the brand's future more than anything else. But that's just the way the giant mech crumbles, right? Unlike most of the projects covered, Megabots wasn't a scam. At most, it was a misleading campaign. But the backers did get their rewards. And Matt has gone to extreme lengths, arguably more than any project I've covered before, going into detail about how every single penny was spent using the backers and the investors' money. The end result may not be what we always dreamed, but to date, it's the closest thing we have to giant fighting robots. A huge thanks to Matt for being so open and allowing me to interview him for two hours for this Kickscammer show. If you want to watch the interview in full, then please do consider becoming a backer of Slopes Game Room at any level. Backers will not only get this plus plenty of other unedited interviews, but they get access to a whole heap of extra stuff too, including having the ability to join in live as I record my monthly Kickscammer news segments that appear on the second channel. Links to everything can be found down below. It's just a bad business. You know, if you just think about it, like, yeah, building million dollar robots to destroy each other, like, it literally sounds like you're just lighting money on fire. Hey there guys, thank you all so much for checking out the video. This one was a lot of fun to make. This was suggested to me by email uh, maybe two or three years ago. Uh, I'm glad I waited this long because it meant I get to learn more, a lot more about that staged fight. And um, yeah, thanks to Matt for actually allowing me to interview him for this video. Like I said, if you guys want to support the channel uh, via Patreon and YouTube members, then you will be, uh, be able to see the full, like, two hours plus it's just like just over two hours long completely uncut interview where we went in depth with everything that went on through this quite a lot didn't make it into the video so you want to go check that out there's links down below to become a patreon or a youtube member but this is the part of the video where i'd like to give a massive shout out to all of my patreons and youtube members uh especially including the following uh we're gonna give a massive shout out to i've lost my place here we go Z uh, Ziggy Golightly, Ye Old Hamburglar, Vike Echo, Vitas Varnes, Tim, uh, Todd Paul Flo G, Tim Lund, The Sneaky Ferret, The Old Man Cometh, That Gamer, Steven, Shadow Dragon, Sir Nilsson, Ryan Holtz, Ryan Burford, Roven Army, Richard Aldegic, Ray Blair, Roll VP, Over Jarl Zane, Nicholas Burtner, Mind of the Unsane, Mike Fallon, Matt Jackson, Man Shovel, Cat Layton, Jura, John Rogers, Jeff Mianowski, James. Jabba Al Aiden, Jay is Manchild, uh, Ian Quell, Game Apologist, Derekuda, Dina81, Dina, uh, Action Saxon, Conrad Constantine, Clan Bob, Christopher Devero, Chevmatic, Bram Perez, Boots and Pup, <laughs> Ben Zuko, Benjamin Guy, Ashley Philpot, Arista, Andrew Dalton, Amelia Lau, Akatima84, Agro Crag, and Aaron Gorman. I threw myself off completely because I worked from bottom to top i worked from z to a rather than the other way around regardless yeah thank you to all of you guys who support the channel and all you people out there that are not patrons and youtube members just giving the video a like leaving a comment sharing it on a discord social media reddit all that sort of stuff that really does help the video more than you know so however you decide to support the channel guys thank you seriously thank you so much but until next time guys this is dj slope signing out and hopefully i'll see you all next time catch you later bye bye Thank <laughs> you.